And come on, there we go. And it's recording, and we'll go ahead and get started. Well, for those of you, again, that are joining us, welcome to the Army CA program. Uh, we're excited to have each and every one of you join with us, either as vendors who may already be in the system or potential vendors who may be wanting to join the Army CA program. Uh, we look forward to giving you a lot of great information today. And then, of course, making these slides as well as the links to the videos and everything else available for you for you to use uh, at your leisure. There's a lot of great things going on with the Army Ignited system. It will come back online on Monday. It's been down since the 25th of February. So on Monday morning, the site will come back up and it will not only host the CA side of the house, but will also uh, host the TA side of the house as well. So we're really excited about that. A lot of moving parts happening right now, but uh, without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and jump into the training with you guys and uh, get this going. So the first thing we're gonna go over in our training, we're gonna discuss the Vendor Memorandum of Agreement, or you'll hear me refer to it as the MOA. I'm going to go over the purpose, the regulation that guides the MOA, the vendor requirements, the administration of the CA program, the installation MOA, and signing the dotted line at the end. So this document was created to give you an understanding of the six different sections of the MOA. Uh, the MOA, it reads, it has a lot of legal jargon into it, so we wanted to create this training to kind of break it down for you and give you an idea of what are the main highlights and responsibilities that you as a vendor would have as being a part of this program. Uh, the idea behind the, the Army CA program and what you're going to be doing as a vendor is that we're making a way to advance the personal education and career aspirations of our soldiers and also prepare them for a future career. But while they're still serving in the Army, we want them to be able to take those skill sets that they've obtained in, from their civilian credentials and licensures and be able to think outside of the box and bring another perspective to the field when, when on a mission or working in a team development scenario. So these are things that we want to provide to those soldiers. And then at the end of the day, because not everyone's going to stay in uniform for the rest of their life, we want to make sure that when they transition out of the Army, they can be assets to the civilian sector on day one and enhance and strengthen our nation. Hey, Russell. Yes. Hey, Russell, I'm here for any questions you got in the box, okay? All right, thank you. Uh-huh. All right, so talking about the Vendor Memorandum of Agreement, it's guided by Army Regulation 621-5, that's Army Continuing Education System, dated 28 October 2019, and also the CA policy dated 10 September 2020. Here are the links for those items. You can also locate it on the Army Cool website, and we'll give you uh, that information here a little bit down the line where you can look up Army Cool and pull this information. And also this will be available again on the video and on the slides as we send them out to you. So vendor responsibilities and requirements. Uh, making sure that you understand that a CA MOA, the installation MOA, and the, uh, the educational MOU or the DOD MOU that you may sign are all three separate documents. Here's what I mean. The Army CA program MOA tells you that you have the ability to participate in the Army Credentialing Assistance Program and uh, eventually be approved as, an, a vendor so, as a vendor so the soldiers can reach out and utilize your resources. The installation MOA gives you the capability to be able to bring uh, your information onto a post and at the, at the understanding and approval of the base education office, uh, excuse me, the post education office to distribute that information out. And then of course, the DOD MOU tells you what you can and can't do as far as providing courses on post uh, to the soldiers, uh, your marketing aspect and uh, so forth. So just remember those three separate things and we'll hit on those a couple more times during this training. It's important that our vendors comply with the Department of the Army's policies. Mainly for you, it's gonna be the MOA and Army Regulation 621-5. That you're also following state and federal requirements regarding distance education. And that you designate a point of contact, which now is available on the application. We'll be able to show you guys that here shortly. 
but designate a point of contact that not only we will be able to get a hold of in the event that we have questions or if you submit an application and it's rejected, that individual will get the email as to why it was rejected. And then, of course, uh, the, stu the soldier themselves to be able to contact you if they have questions. So those are uh, some big points on the first part of the MOA. Uh, before recommending private loans or to students, we ask that our vendors provide soldiers access to financial aid counselors who can give them uh, different opportunities to receive that funding in the event that their, their cost exceeds the 4,000 that they get per year. And we'll hit on that a little bit more later on. No special favors. This means no offering gratuity, discounts, entertainment, meals, transportation, hospitality, lodging, etc. These items are not permitted. If you do offer a military discount for your services across the board, we greatly appreciate that and that is okay, but offering items like entertainment or lodging costs or travel costs is not is not uh, allowed. The Department of the Army expects our vendors and our business partners to have the highest level of integrity when working through the programs. Uh, this includes the ban of commissions, bonuses, or other incentive items for securing enrollments or finan federal financial aid. So more or less uh, not giving extra bonus checks to your employees for securing butts and seats, if you will. There's no automatic program renewals, bundling multiple credential courses or enrollments, and I'll hit back to the bundling in just a moment here. Each training course enrollment will be approved by the student and the Department of the Army prior to the start of the course. So when I say bundling multiple credentials, I mean if you have a CompTIA, uh, Security Plus, A Plus, Sec Plus, if you're trying to take all those and bump them all into one cost uh, so the uh, the soldiers can get all this for a low discount cost that's not authorized on our end because they have to go for each credential separately. However, and this will be identified in the, the next set of training, which we'll do on the application process. If you offer a training bundle and that training bundle offers the exam, offers the books, offers the preparatory course, uh, offers study material, that is okay. And we'll show you how you can do that in just a moment. Do not allow service members to begin your course without payment and authorization from DA. Here's why. There's instances where the soldier may not be paid for until the day the course starts. And that could be because of continuing resolution uh, where the budget hasn't been approved and sent to DOD yet. Because of that, we may have to wait and make the payment at the very last moment. If you don't receive payment for that soldier, do not let them proceed. But I will tell you that our finance team has done a phenomenal job on making sure that the payments have been getting taken care of uh, and they're doing a great job staying ahead of the ball. So again, only those outlined situations where you've got uh, the continuing resolution that's really affecting the budget or other items like that that may cause the payment to be delayed until the day of. Prior to enrollment, full disclosure is uh, highly important that our vendors provide the total cost and resources that they're providing, not only within their vendor application that you'll create on Army Ignited, but as well as your itemized price quote that each soldier will receive. Here's to deal with the itemized price quotes. The soldier will contact you before creating their credentialing request, the funding for their request to get an itemized price quote from you. This tells us that they have contacted you and that you two have spoken about what dates are available for them to take this course. Now, when I say itemized price quote, we've had a lot of vendors ask us, well, is there a certain format that you require for this? Here's what we require, and this could be on an email to the soldier as well as to us if you want a courtesy copy else on it. But the main things we're looking for is to have your company's information, so the vendor name, address, phone number, fax, uh, email, URL, et cetera, the soldier's name, the dates of the courses that you're looking at providing, and then a breakdown of each item that's being provided during that training. Again, that's that the training course, the books, the exam voucher if you offer it, et cetera. All of that broken down in the costs associated with it, and then the total cost at the bottom. 
that can be on an actual uh, itemized invoice form or it could be on an email document but either one is acceptable as long as uh, it's sent to the soldier that they can submit for their ca request vendors will provide all information regarding enrollments withdrawals cancellations completions failures etc to the department of army upon request now we're not going to ask you for something and we're not going to call you today and say hey we need these documents by close of business today we're going to give you ample opportunity to be able to get this information together and provide it to us but we ask that you are able to provide us that information electronically uh, upon request Per Title 20 U.S. Code Section 1232G, also known as FERPA, our vendors will not release personally identifiable non-directory information to third parties without the authorization of the soldier. Um, some of you may also know that as being called PII. You cannot release their information without the, the agreement between you and the soldier, and that must be done prior to the approval of their enrollment. So administration of the credentialing assistance program. The Department of Army provides the guidelines for the DA regulations, for CA regulations. Uh, the vendor will comply with these requirements and regarding to, and a biggest part of that is regarding to returning funds. So here's the deal with uh, the return of funds. If you have a soldier who's interested in participating in your course and they withdraw from your course prior to the start date, the soldier is responsible for contacting us first. Let us know that they are withdrawing. Then our finance team will reach out to you. Excuse me, I apologize. We'll reach out to you to request for the refund. If a soldier has begun a course, say they're two weeks into the course, and then all of a sudden they have a family emergency, they get put on orders, they get deployed, etc. That member still needs to contact us and let us know that we're, we're they are withdrawing and then our finance team will contact you and request up to 60 percent of that course back now if a soldier decides that uh they want to start a course with you and they're in two weeks to it and they're like you know what this just isn't what i thought it was and i don't want to do this anymore if that soldier doesn't have a valid reason for dropping that course it'll be the soldier who's responsible for paying that money back not you so again, that's why it's important for that soldier to have communication with us throughout the process. Uh, if they're needing to withdraw prior to start, if they get put on orders or emergency happens, they have to contact us and let us know. Let me see here, next slide. The cost to the soldiers will not differ or exceed the rate charged to non-military members. Again, if your business offers a military discount, we greatly appreciate that and that is okay for the soldiers to utilize, but those costs should not exceed what their non-military uh, counterparts are paying for the course. Vendors will provide the total cost of each program or credential to the Department of the Army annually. So we just finished up last week our annual review of our vendor accounts uh, and that means each one of our vendors that are already approved on army, army ignited have gone in they've reviewed their applications they've updated their costs if need be and they've submitted those back into us once we get those those are now locked down for the year until january february time frame of 2022. now there is an exception to that in the event that you are implementing a brand new course or uh, we know that some of the colleges that we work with their fiscal year starts in july so if their costs change around that time frame they can submit us a an email letting us know hey we need to make these changes it's 90 days prior to implementation so we can review it for you and send it back, say, yes, good to go, go ahead and submit it, or no, this is something that has to wait until the new fiscal year rolls around. If you know that your course is going to be canceled, either for distance learning or classroom courses, we ask that you notify that soldier immediately, as they have five days to notify the, the credentialing assistance program about the cancellation. 
Vendors will not request payment for materials or accessibility or for seats prior to confirmation on our end. That means you can't tell the soldier, hey, you have to put down a deposit to be able to sit for this course. Them contacting you is the proof that they're looking to proceed with that course with you. The payment is the authorization. So make sure that you're not requesting payment from them on the front end as they will not be, in, be, rever, be reimbursed. Excuse me, can't talk this afternoon. Service members uh, come to you for services, so please make sure that you're not doing high pressure ta recruitment tactics when trying to secure the soldiers. What I mean by that is if you are a retired military member and you own a business, uh, you can't go on to a post and start distributing your information without letting the education office know, without letting the installation know, having those uh, MOAs signed for that. Just because you have access onto the base, you have to have installation MOA or DOD MOU access to be able to put your information out there on the installation. So please make sure you're not doing that. Again, remember the installation MOA and the MOA for the CA part are two separate parts. Installation access is being allowed on post and installation MOA allows you to provide teaching and instruction on base. Your, your MOA with the CA side of the house allows you to participate in this program as a vendor. Ensure that you coordinate with the base uh, with the post education advisor. Uh, not just a service member saying that, hey, we want to set up a training course in our day room. It has to be coordinated through the education advisor to make sure that uh, it's authorized at that time on base and that you sign the applicable documents. If you're hosting a course on post, you have to make sure that all eligible individuals that could be uh, adult family members, DOD civilians, military retirees, eligible soldiers, et cetera. All those members that would be eligible to sit for that course, it has to be made available for them to be able to sit for that course in, in conjunction with the soldiers that are also paying through being paid for through Army CA. Make sure you provide the education advisor a tentative annual schedule of the courses that you're looking at offering to make sure that the schedule correlates with what the base has going on at that time. Make sure you inform the education advisor of any on-base cancellations. Coordinate with the education advisors on the availability of resources, i.e. classrooms, uh, furnishings, repairs that need to be done, janitorial services, etc. And remember that the Department of Army reserves the right to disapprove DOD installation access to any employee or agent of the vendor. That means if you have an employee that comes on post and they are uh, causing issues or there's an issue or concern with that individual, they can be asked by the Department of the Army to leave the post. And of course, the most important part, making sure you sign the MOA. So there's two key parts of the MOA that need your attention right off the bat. The first one is right under the header. It says this is agreement between the Department of Army headquarters and right below and you should have your vendor name right there in that spot. And then at the very bottom on the left hand side, you want to make sure that your vendor name, which would be the individual of the that would be signing this, their title, make sure that it's someone in your company's leadership chain. So the owner, the CEO, the president, etc., is signing it. And then the agency name again, that's going to be your vendor name again right there in that spot. If you need to, you can type this in. You can print it out and sign it and send it back to us or you can. Um, yeah, you can send it to us those way, but do not send it through DocuSign. Uh, if you send it through DocuSign, our leadership cannot sign it, and we'll have to send it back to you to get it fixed. So uh, use one of those two methods. You can either type it in, or you can print it out and sign it. Or if you have another mechanism to sign it electronically, other than DocuSign, you can utilize that. Uh, we haven't seen many issues with the other signing options, but we do see issues with DocuSign. So the key items that we went over in this first part of the training, uh, we went over the vendor memorandum of agreement, also known as the MOA, the purpose of it, the Army regulation guiding it, 621-5, Army Continuing Education System, dated 28 October 2019, the vendor requirements, administration of the CA program, the installation MOA, and finally signing the dotted line. 
So before we go on to the next part of the training, do we have any questions that may have popped up in the box yet? No, Russell, got no, no questions in the box at this point. Outstanding. So then what I will do, I will pull up our next set of training here. All right, and the next part of the training that we're going to talk about is the actual creating an account, getting an invite to join Army Ignited, and the processes that you'll need to do there. Also, we're gonna give you some examples of some of the applications to give you an idea of how to set those up when you're setting up your trainings. Again, we're gonna talk about the invite, creating the account, the new process of doing it, and this was actually taught to us not even 48 hours ago. So we're excited to give this to you because this is what you're going to see on Monday morning when the system comes up. We're going to go over the four separate parts of the vendor uh, application, your vendor information, the payment, the requirements section, and adding the trainings. We're going to go over keeping up with your application and then how you help our soldiers and ultimately the nation. So many of you may be asked by soldiers, hey, we don't see your, your uh, location on Army Ignited. Can we get your information or can we request that you're added to the Army Ignited site? Or you yourselves may say, hey, we really have heard a lot about this program. We want to be involved with it. Can you help us become a vendor with the Army Ignited program? This email that you see right here on your screen is what you're going to see from us first thing. We're going to shoot this out to you. It's got the information for setting up your account. It's got the information for creating a cage code, which I'll go over shortly, the Q&A, and also the vendor MOA attached to it. So with the MOA, again, read, sign, return that document to us. It is a mandatory requirement to be a part of the Army CA program. The cage code, this is a mandatory item. It is not provided by us. However, you can go to SAM.gov, uh, the normal time frame that we've seen for them to get back with you and get your cage code initiated is normally between two weeks and as long as we've seen it, it's about a month and a half. But know that they've got cage codes coming in, not only for uh, DOD, but all outside uh, partners as well and all outside businesses. So uh, this is a big thing that they have going, but be patient with them. They will contact you back, let you know what your cage code is and what your expiration date of that cage code is. Once you've gotten that, you're going to log into the Army Ignited site, and there's a link for it right there, www.armyignited.com. The best browsers we've seen utilize this are Microsoft Edge, Firefox, and those of you who like to, you can use Chrome. Uh, but we ask that you don't use Internet Explorer because the system doesn't populate populate everything for you on Internet Explorer. So I would recommend staying away from that as a browser of choice. You're going to want to click the Get Started button on the home page, and it's going to help you create an account in login.gov. If you already have a login.gov account, please use that account. Don't recreate the will uh, as it will recognize that previous account. If you are a government employee, then you should select the government employee ID as your authentication method. But if you are a, uh, a non-government employee, you're gonna select the phone option. And the next couple slides here will show you pictures and examples of how all of that looks for you. So again, this is what Army Ignited looks like when you go to the website. You're gonna first select that option to create an account. It's going to get you started with the login.gov information. Again, if you don't have an account, it's going to walk you through doing that process. Make sure you're checking that email account that you used for the login.gov as it will send you the information back that you need to finish creating your account. Once that's done, you're going to confirm the email address that's set up with it. Create a strong password. Um, most of them through the authentication method, if you're using that, uh, that process. Uh, I know for us, and I know a lot of some of the vendors, it sends you a uh, text message to your phone. That's why you use the phone option. It'll send you that text message with a code. You can put that code in and it helps you log in as well. And again, there's that uh, 
the request the phone number you wanted to send the code to and it'll send a code to you. It'll tell you what you're doing signing in for the first time for uh, Army Ignited and login.gov. Once you've done that you'll and you've created an account, you'll have access to add your email address, edit the password if you need to, delete account, work on your two-factor authentication, etc. So that's a big part with the login.gov part of the process. And here's some information on the how-to guides there, the remedy line for Army Ignited. There's a phone number right there. You can also log into the Army Cool uh, webpage. You can go to www.cool.osd.mil slash army, and that'll take you directly to the Army Cool webpage. And then, of course, you can follow the links here, and it'll give you the information such as the vendor CA process guide that was just updated that includes a good bit of these slides as well. If you need to contact us, this is our email address down here at the bottom. And again, it'll be made available to you at the end of uh, this training via the slides and the videos as well. All right, so now that you are getting ready to log in to Army Ignited, you can do that authentication with login.gov right here. It's going to bring you into the site and you'll see an option to request a user account. You're going to select that option. And it's going to bring you here where it says create a case for a guest user. Now, what's new to the system, a lot of you have been communicating with us via email. And sometimes it's a little bit harder to get back to you or you get back to us or you to track the last email traffic or where everything's at. They've, they've improved this process to make it that much better for you. There's a program out there that this is linked to now called ServiceNow or also known as Snow. Uh, this site, once you log on to it, it's going to give you the opportunity to fill out your information, your name, uh, first, last name, email address, contact phone number, your preferred contact method, method the subject that you're looking to talk about, uh, the case type, the subcategory, et cetera. In part four, you want to make sure you're putting your name of your institution, your URL, anything else relevant that we need to know, and this will help us with staying in communication with you as well as you'll be able to log in and see this and say okay uh it's with this department right now or this individual has logged into it and they're working it so you can get real-time updates on where your process is so once you get into the army ignited site you'll see where it says here start vendor onboarding and you'll see where it says welcome and it'll have your name up there at the top. You'll select this. This gives you access to the how to guides as well, um, as well as if you are interested in adding training or if you see a uh, certification or licensure is not on there, it should be available to you there through the help center. If not, you can go onto the Army Cool webpage, select contact us, and it gives you the option if there's a certification that's not listed on Army Cool that you'd like to see listed or uh, like to see reviewed, you can put it in right there. Now let's get into the nuts and bolts of this, the four separate parts of the application itself. We're gonna go over where your vendor name, URL, address, city, state, zip, country, and how many years you've been in business. Please note that it is mandatory for you to have been in business a minimal of two years to participate in the Army CA program. There is no waiver to this. So if you've only been in business about 20, about 18 months or so, we ask that you wait until you get that full two year mark and then submit back with us. And then of course, being able to add the main POC. You see here down at the bottom, this was just recently added to the, uh, the application process first part of the screen the person that you put in here is the one that you not only want us to be able to contact but also the soldier to be able to reach back and contact if they have questions so make sure that this individual is updated if not it's going to be the primary uh funding plc will auto populate there and i'll show you that here in just a moment it'll auto populate with that individual's name hey russell uh -huh. we got a question here uh they're taking over as the firm's POC uh, and the prior POC is no longer with them. How do they obtain ownership of, of this? 
Good question. So what you'll need to do is go on to the Army Ignited site and request for an account. Once that account is created, it'll send us an email that says, please uh, add me as a vendor to such and such location. What we'll do is we'll take your account and that account and we'll pair them together with the vendor code. That way you will have full access to be able to make changes on that account from here on out. Does that answer your question? Yep, Roger that, Roger that, Russ, we're good. Outstanding, all right. Uh, so we're gonna go into part two here and that covers your federal tax ID, your cage code, cage code expiration, the access funding questions, the primary and alternate funding POCs. So you can see here, that's this is what that second part's gonna look like and I have it in two different sections because it's one long page, but you'll see you'll input your federal tax ID, your cage code, the cage code expiration, and then you get to the first four questions. These are important to make sure that you read thoroughly because these are required to be able to participate in the Army CA program. The first one is understanding that exams and training will not be funded together unless the exam is free. I will go over that in the application to show you what we mean by that. The next part is that the Army pays via a government credit card, making sure you accept this form of payment. The third part is access will make the payments on behalf of the soldier, so you cannot request the funds from the soldier. We will pay for the soldier with our finance team. They will reach out to you and make the payments for the soldier. If a soldier pays out of pocket in advance, the Army will not reimburse them. So make sure if you have a soldier coming to you telling you, hey, I'm just going to pay this out of pocket, make sure they understand that they will not be reimbursed and that um, the Department of the Army won't won't backdate it or anything else for them. So make sure they use the process that they have smartly. And then finally, about the refunds, we talked to you about that a little bit in the, the MOA process, but this says that you understand uh, that a refund may be asked for on, on behalf of the soldier. And then you have two options for the primary and alternate PLC. Again, if you do not put a PLC in the main PLC, this primary PLC for payment will be uh, put in there in default. Make sure you put the information in there correctly. Your, your name, first name, last name, your country code, your full phone number. We've seen where individuals have left off a number from us and we have to send it back to you for you to fix and also a email address. And same thing with the alternate PLC. I think we had a couple more questions that just popped up in there, Chris. No, we're good. Sophia's already answered. Uh, let's see. I got one more. Uh, what do you mean by Army credit card? So is it a Visa, the, MasterCard, AMX, or Discover? Yes, it is a Visa card that the Department of the Army will contact you to make the payment on behalf of the soldiers with. So uh, just making sure that you uh, accept uh, the Visa card. It is a Visa card. That answer your question? Roger that, Russ. We're good. Outstanding. All right, part three, the requirements. You'll see the certificate of completion. That is a major requirement with the program. The accrediting and approving authorities. I'll go over that in just a moment. And the vendor URLs and files. So this is what the third section is going to look like for you. And it says, will, will a certificate of completion or proof be provided for the course or exam? This is a mandatory item. We have to have a certificate of completion. We've had vendors ask, so what do you mean by a certificate of completion? If you have a, a soldier that comes to your course, you can either make up a nice certificate using Adobe and create one that way, or if you send them in courtesy copy us an email saying, this is our information here of our business. We had this soldier take this training on this date, they passed or failed. And that's what you'll send back to us if you do it by email that will also suffice the next set of questions here the accrediting and approving authorities it is okay if you do not uh, have any of these bodies that you're accredited by okay that is perfectly fine you can mark no for these if you are definitely mark yes because it helps with our our stats and our data tracking but if you're not it's not a game changer I'll show you the bottom of the document here. 
Then you have three sections. The first one talks about adding your syllabus or your course documents. The second one talks about if you have statistics about students that have taken your course and passed. And the third part is about statistics that of soldiers or students that may have been hired from taking your course. Again, if you don't have these items, that's fine. But what we do ask that you put in is your vendor URL in every one of those boxes. Here's why. We found that the system sometimes doesn't save your information if the URLs are not in there. So anywhere on the application, you see where it says URL, either be it your URL or we'll show you during the application where you can put like a URL for Amazon or something. Fill out those URLs. Don't leave any boxes blank. All right, so part four, this is where it gets fun. This is where you're going to add the new trainings and there's two separate screens that you're gonna see in regards to part four. The first one's gonna show you the training or exam name, if it's a training or exam, the associated credential name, and it must be a credential that is in the Army Cool site. So let me tell you the difference between the two real quick. Army Cool is a repository for all the credentials and licensures that a soldier would be eligible to take. Everything from your project management professional to your private pilot, to your CompTIA, to your, uh, your mortuary affairs or mortician license, all of those items are going to be on the Army Ignited site if they're approved. If they're not approved and on Army Ignited, you will not be able to pair them, all, excuse me, if they're not approved on Army Cool, you will not be able to pair them on the Army Ignited site. So make sure when you hit the drop down, and I'll show you that here right now, there's a drop down that'll drop right here where it says associated credential name. You'll find that credential that you're looking to attach your training or exam to, and you'll put it there. Also the format, if it's online, if it's in person, or if it's a hybrid of the two, you have the opportunity to jump in there and put that right there. And then of course, it'll ask you the locations you offer it. So if you offer this course only in Arkansas, or if you have a format where you can offer this all around the world, you can identify all those locations and it'll populate and show the soldier where this is available to them. Hey, the Russell. Second yes, sir. Hey, we got a question that came in. What What is the easiest way uh, for them to change their uh, the POC uh, for their credentialing agency? The POC on the application? You know, once like uh, any, when they want to change it, what is the easiest way uh, to switch around our POC's name. Got you. So now that we're doing the annual reviews, the easiest way is going to be for you to contact us and say, hey, we need to change the POC on our application. We'll write you back, say, yep, you're good to go. Go forward. You'll log into your application. You'll make the changes to those POCs and then hit, re uh, hit submit. It'll come back to us and then we'll make it live again for the field. Did that answer your question on that one? Yeah, I believe so. Sophia also chimed in, so we're good. Okay, outstanding. So the second part of the screen here is where you're going to see the cost type for exam or training, the item name, the item provided by the vendor, yes or no, the number or ISBN, the cost quantity, and the URL. So remember we talked about before adding training and exams together. It's a big no-no if both of them have a cost. However, if you're, auditing, if you're uh, allowing for or offering a training bundle, and that bundle includes the exam voucher, it includes books, it includes study materials, uh, practice exams, et cetera, you can put all of those items in here and mark them as yes provided by the vendor and put the cost as $0. And we'll show you that here in just a moment of how you can do that. So this, this is an example if you were just creating a request for an exam, uh, saying that you offer the Senior Human Resources Management Certified Professional. You would mark it as an exam, hit yes, put the cost as $300 as, or whatever the cost would be, and make sure you fill in that URL. This is where you put your URL if it's provided by you. Now this is an example of training of a training bundle. So you see the total cost is on the first line there, the $250. So everything that would be in that bundle should be in that total cost. And then the next item you have the exam. Yes, it's provided by the vendor. 
no cost. Next one is an example of the automotive brake system. So you see here, this is where you can mark no that the item is not provided with you. And that's for anything other than an exam. So this one here, you see that the training course is $380, but it requires a book that the vendor does not offer. So the vendor is going, so what you would do is put in the ISBN number for it, the cost that you found for it, and below this, there will be an option to put the URL. So if you found this book on Amazon, you're going to click that URL that you got from Amazon, copy it and paste it into this document. That way the soldier knows, OK, I can go here and look for this. It should be this cost and I can get this book added to my credential request. Here's an example of a CDL license. So you see the total cost at the top is $4,000. Uh, book is provided, yes, cost is zero. The application fee for the Department of Transportation Physical is provided, so that cost is zero, it's marked as yes. And then the drug test is also provided by this vendor. So again, it's an application fee, marked as yes, and the cost is zero dollars. Now this one here, we've seen this a lot with our vendors who work with private pilot's license, commercial pilot license, and the additional ratings that go with those. Uh, we found where uh, we had issues with vendors where they were adding the FAA check ride onto the listing and putting a cost. Again, that's adding an exam and a training together. So here's what we found. There's two ways to do this. One, again, add the total cost up at the top. If you provide it, mark yes, mark the cost as no. Or two, if you do not provide this exam and you know the soldier's gonna have to go somewhere else to get it, don't even put it on your application. That way the soldier knows that once they complete your training, they need to go to another entity to get the exam paid for and take it. So here's some important takeaways from part four. It's probably the most difficult part for the vendor, thus the reason why we created this training. Uh, bundling is okay for training and, and exams as long as the exam is zero dollars and zero cents. If you don't offer the exam, just don't list it on your application. It's an easy fix for you. If it's a non-exam item such as books, study materials, practice tests, those can be put on the application. They can be marked as no. Make sure you put the cost out there with it, uh, how it can be found, the ISBN number, the URL to it, that way the soldier has all the information they need to go find that item. And remember, at the end of the day, our soldiers were only provided $4,000 per fiscal year. So how can you help them with that, especially if your course costs, say, $12,000 to complete? If you're doing a private pilot's license and you put the cost as $12,000 and uh, you put this on Army Ignited, the soldier's only going to be able to request this one time because they can only request a credential one time. So if they put private pilot's license, the Army is only going to pay $4,000 for them, and then that soldier's got to figure out how to get the rest of the money together. Here's how you can help with them with that. We call it phasing the courses. So instead of just putting private pilot's license, you would put private pilot's license phase one, private pilot's license phase two, et cetera. That way that soldier can come back and select that next phase each year and it's not going against them and they can continue to have the money paid toward it. So that is why we ask you to phase those courses, especially if the cost exceeds $4,000. That way you can help the soldier. Keeping up with your application. Like I mentioned earlier, we just completed our annual reviews for our applications for uh, currently approved vendors in the system. So next year, January, February timeframe we're looking at is when they should be able to go in and update their applications again. Now here's where that differs. If you're offering uh, additional courses uh, or adding new training to your uh, portfolio, or if, uh, like I said, with some of the educational institutions, their fiscal year starts in July, so their costs may not update until then, send us an email at least 90 days prior to implementation of what those changes are going to look like. That way we can give you the green light. You can go ahead and submit that application and then we can review it and approve it and get you back on the system. Otherwise, changes will not be able to be made until the next next year's review. 
So at the end of the day, what are you doing? You are providing a great resource for our soldiers to be able to jump out and be a part of the civilian sector and get the knowledge and skill sets that their civilian counterparts are also entitled to. You are making a pathway for them so when they write up their resumes for the first time, when they get ready to leave the service, that not, o- that not only putting a, uh, a lot of military jargon that our civilian counter- counterparts may not understand, but they're also putting these industry-recognized credentials and licensures on their applications so that reviewing officials can say, oh, wait a minute, you've completed the PMP and you've been certified with it for the last seven years. You become an asset to them right away. So they understand what it is you're capable of and what you're trained on doing. So that's what you, the vendors, are doing. You're helping our soldiers make sure that when it's time for them to make that transition out of the service, that they can do so and be effective on day one. So we talked about the invite email that you would receive, creating an account and the new processes of doing that that will take effect Monday morning, the 8th of March. The four different sections of the vendor application, the vendor information, your payment section, your requirement section, and adding the trainings, keeping up with your application, and how you help our soldiers in the end. At this time, I'd like to open up the floor to any questions or any questions that we might have had come through the box. And again, thank each and every one of you for jumping on here with us today. We greatly appreciate you being here. Over to you. Hey, Russell, I got one that came in. Can a service member request funds for the same course, but a different version? For an example, uh, FY21 Certified Ethical Hacker version 10, and then FY22 Certified Ethical Hacker version 11. Or if the version changes in the same fiscal year, can they can they get funds for both in that same year? All right. I can, I can answer that if you'd like. Go for it. Yeah, so depending on, because you have this specific situation, Certified Ethical ethical Hacker, there's two different versions, Um, is the entire exam being changed? And if you want to come online, you can uh, can speak to that if you'd like. Shannon. Hi, yes, thank you. Um, The exam overall for, for the CEH specifically will not change. Um, but there are other courses like the Security Plus that would be like a 501 and 601 in the same year. So CEH specifically, the overall is called CEH, but like a Network Plus or Security Plus, that version would increase or would change um, with each iteration. Yeah, and so that's fine um, because there and because there was a change, just like with PMP, there's a it changed from last year, and so what was taught last year is not going to work for this year's exam. So that's fine if, as long as you do change it up to where it is different. Uh, does that answer your question? Um, yes, it does. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, and any other questions in there? Yeah, there's two more in here. Uh, we offer certification exams. If uh, they submit to have it paid for but fail, can they reapply and have the CA program fund the retake, or is it really only one a one-time deal? It is a one-time deal. Uh, Russell, hold on real quick. As far as what she's saying, once they do, let's say they take that exam, they fail it, and they're being recouped for that specific exam, as long as their recoupment has been initiated, they can request that same exam again after that, after they um, initiate or make their decision on how they're going to pay back the one that they failed. So it is possible, yes. I was going to say that. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) No, and you made it sound so much better. Thanks, Sophia. (laughs) Hey, Russell, the next one, does continuing education apply if it's for renewal of credentials that are listed in COOL, i.e. for social work licenses? So I'll I'll go ahead and take that one as well. Um, So as far as the continuing education, we can fund renewals for that type of, uh, you know, it's, it's a renewal, yes. So we could potentially 
uh, pay for that. If that credential, and if, if you are being specific to social work, if that is actually listed in Army Cool and there is a renewal process, yes, we do pay for recertifications. I hope that answers your question, Andy. And Sophia, it looks like that one uh, from Amit, uh, we might need to get them to come online and give some more specifics. Uh, looks like they've tried to add the program, but it got rejected twice and they need some help and have some questions. Who can they contact to get one-on-one -on -one assistance in adding a program? Russell, you could go ahead and take that one if you want to uh, discuss with them. I guess I'm just wondering, yeah, maybe a Mitch should come online. Like when you say you've been trying to add a program, are you talking about in Army Ignited? Uh, maybe he, maybe a Mitch doesn't have a, uh, a mic. Oh, you don't have a mic. Okay. So if, if you could just, um, because everyone is teleworking, we don't give out our phone numbers. So email is the best way. If you would like to email us there, you can see the email box there. Um, please email with your questions. And then we can address that if that if you're talking about in Army Ignited. And then um, Russell Lindsay Howard asked, once you submit an application in Army Ignited, how long does it take to get approved and online for service members to see? Russell? I guess it would help if I remove the mute. <laughs> I, I was just sitting there talking away, having a good old time. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. OK, so we review uh, when the system comes back up on Monday morning, we review applications that come into us on a daily basis. Um, I know I've got a good bit of applications that are waiting to be reviewed and that I've gotten emails from vendors uh, that they're waiting to be reviewed. The process is relatively smooth and quick as long as you've got everything in there that you've got to have. You've submitted us your MOA and you're good to go. Um, once we review it, we shoot you back an email right away to let you know that we'll send you the approval email to let you know that you've been that you're good to go and that soldiers can start to see your account. So it's a pretty quick process. Uh, I will ask your patient with me uh, because I do have a lot of them in the box, and, but I go through as many as I can a day. And my goal is to make sure when I leave every day that there's nothing in the box. Uh, but if I don't get to you right away, uh, shoot me an email or whatever. We'll get you squared away. You're very welcome. So Amit, going back to your question, can you email me a number? OK, just again, um, if you provide a number or an email, then we can try to set something up with you. Like I was saying, we're teleworking, so we don't give out our personal cell phones but we can set something up with you to assist. Um, did you, if you got, uh, usually Russell sends out like a message of why exactly something was rejected. So whoever was on that actual uh, email probably has the information on why. And Mr. Sherwala, if you want to, uh, because I know I've emailed you a couple of times as well. Um, if you want to just respond back an email to me, um, and we can get you set up with a uh, training session. I can do it for you through Teams, and we can do it that way and communicate with you to get you taken care of, or I can give you a call if I need to, if uh, the information I sent you previously you're not understanding, I can get you taken care of there. Anything else we have out there? Yeah, Russell, we got one that uh, one from David. They were in the process of applying as a CA vendor just prior to Ignited going offline. How can we find out the status of that application? Uh, we did receive the email uh, for this training. 
Uh, what's the vendor name? University. David, David, I'm not sure if you can come online or not. We need... University of West Florida, or is that West or East? West, University of West Florida. Let me see here what I've got. Did you receive an email back from us telling us that your account had been uh, approved? I think they're still typing. One sec, Russell. Because I am showing that we do have your MOA on file uh, as of 10-9-20. Um, I don't have you as an approved vendor yet, so that means that we may not have gotten to your application before the site went down. But as soon as it comes up on Monday, that's one of the first uh, areas I plan on tackling are the vendors' applications that came in. So if it did come in uh, on and it's sitting in the queue for us to take a look at, uh, we'll take a look and get the get through with those on Monday and send you out an email of if it's good or if there's anything that needs to be fixed, what you need to do. You're very welcome. Right. Yeah. And Sophia's already answered uh, the other question, so I don't think we have any more. Awesome. Well, that's perfect timing because this is uh, this ends at two o'clock, so we we rock this out. Again, I want to thank each and every one of you for joining us today. Thank you for what you do for our soldiers and what you're considering doing for our soldiers and ultimately our nation. Uh, it's with these resources and these skill sets that our soldiers will obtain that will make them valued assets to the civilian sector when they get ready to step out into the into the civilian community. So thank you again. I will make sure that uh, yes, e you all will probably receive an email on Monday. Um, that email will have the slides, it'll have the video link, um, that way you can utilize them as you need, and you can send them out to those peers who may be working with you who are unable to attend today. So y'all will have that first thing Monday, I'll make sure that gets ginned up today, and over to my counterpart so she can get it emailed out to you first thing Monday morning. You're very welcome. All right. Well, everybody have a great weekend. Be safe. And we look forward to talking to you all uh, very soon. Thank you again. Thank you. Have a good weekend. You as well. Great job, Russell. Thanks. Always appreciate the top cover. Crammy. Thanks, Chris, for taking care of the messages for me again. Oh, no problem. Thanks, Chris. Roger that. The others that are left here, chance to come off the line. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.